Great, you are live. And I'll drop the link to the YouTube live stream in the Zoom chat because sometimes people ask questions there too. So just if you wanna keep an eye on both places. Oh yeah, that'd be helpful, thank you. Okay. Oh. Okay, it's getting started, I guess. So, all right, uh, well, now that we've walked uh, live here. Well, welcome everybody. Hi, uh, this is Sandy Yagarwal. I'd like to uh, welcome you all on behalf of the Hyperledger uh, Gaming Subgroup. So, Hyperledger Gaming Subgroup is basically, as you would have guessed by the name, is uh, it's a uh, open source community of uh, folks who are interested in the intersection of blockchain and gaming. And we are specifically interested in uh, uh, basically uh, coming up with the best practices and architectural framework uh, for use of blockchains uh, in the gaming industry where applicable in a practical way, uh, hoping to stay away from the hype. And as part of this, we basically have a learn and do uh, uh, approach. we we'll basically, we really want to learn from the industry experts uh, like Profile. Uh, and uh, that's why we invited Profile here. And uh, by uh, going to detail use cases and by doing experimentation with an iterative uh, uh, approach. So we're going to be having a series of discussions uh, with uh, different industry experts, uh, starting with the file. And that brings us to the file. So the file, I'll just say a couple of quick words about him. And then of course, you'll, you'll see what kind of work they've done uh, uh, you know, on some of the slides. So the file is actually an industry veteran of more than uh, 25 or 26 years. He's been uh, in the gaming industry and in game design and development. Uh, and uh, he's worked across multiple studios, uh, very prominent ones, including uh, Looking Glass, ID Software, uh, working with John Cadmack uh, at the genesis of uh, uh, We Are uh, back in 2011, I guess, uh, and uh, uh, Electronic Arts, Activision Blizzard, Bethesda, and Nintendo, just to name a few. Currently, uh, File is the founder and CEO of uh, Symbol Zero, and they specialize in producing virtual concerts uh, for the likes of Roblox, and a uh, prominent one, uh, the Lil Nas X concert, was actually the second largest uh, uh, virtual concert by audience. So without much further delay, I'll give you a file. A file, thank you. All right, good, good. Um, so uh, hello everybody. Um, I'm going to um, be looking at the intersection of, of blockchain and gaming. Um, it's a hot topic today. Um, uh, especially uh, kind of where we are in, in the news with um, the, the, the NFT bubble. Um, there's a lot of activity. Um, and, uh, and frankly, this is an area that uh, the game industry itself is trying to make sense of. Um, so um, I, I'll, I guess I'll start by saying that there's, there's no, there are no easy answers. And um, uh, these, are, you know, these are my perspectives kind of coming at this, but I'm, I'm trying to look at this um, not just from the moment, but from a historical perspective. So I'll dive into some of that. Um, but first, let's start this sharing again. Um, let's see here. Okay. Let's make sure we can see this. Perfect. Good. Um, so the intersection of blockchain and gaming. Um, there we go. Okay, yeah, there's a little bit of lag, not too much. Good, good. Okay, so um, so who am I? Uh, I'm a traditional game designer. Um, I've done you know done some consulting on casual, but a lot of my experience is kind of core games across PC, console, mobile, um, and then more recently, uh, my group has been. Uh, diving into things with Roblox, uh, probably the two biggest of which are the Little Nas X concert and the twenty one uh, in twenty twenty, and the the um, uh, twenty one Pilots concert in twenty twenty one. Now, um, we're the kind of primary um, high res concert provider for Roblox. We're going to be continuing to do things with them, and we're using that as a jumping off point to find our own space and pacing in virtual events as everybody begins to talk about the metaverse. Um, I will say that I'm not going to intentionally talk about the metaverse here. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a thing that I could wax poetic on for hours. Um, it's, um, 
sadly ironic because we're still so far from it. Um, but there's a lot of ground to get to it. And I really want to talk more about the ground going towards it rather than the uh, ill-defined inspiration that comes out of um, uh, film and, and, and books that, uh, that we will eventually get to if we're lucky. So um, I want to start first with this. Um, Technology is not a religion, um, Bitcoin or otherwise. Um, we are in a space now where quite a number of people are treating um, it as it, treating Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and NFTs as a religion. But I think that we can all come from the perspective that there's a lot of really interesting technology there, and we need to put it into perspective. Um, I. I um, come from kind of a training that I, I can remember sitting down with, uh, with my former boss and mentor, John Carmack, and he was always very clear about the notion that um, when we were building, we were platform and device agnostic, um, that we were building first and foremost for whatever devices were in front of us and we we're optimizing for those. Uh, that we would use a mixture of what was local on device and what could support that online. And the important thing was to take what was there, you know, whether we were working at that point for PC, for console, for mobile, uh, experimenting with bits of VR. Um, you know, this was effectively a little bit more than 10 years ago, but the notion that these were all computing devices and the most important thing was to make them sing. Um, it was not to put one above the other, but to know that these were just different user interfaces for getting at computing. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to balance this with, with you know, some text heavy bits. I'm not going to read those out um, and, and some graphics, but um, I, I want to just have us think about um, some of the key aspects of things that are game technology. Um, consoles to PC uh, that start to then get balanced out with, with this thread of online from ARPANET to BitNet to the internet. Um, optical storage change things drastically. Um, the GPU is, is kind of the other big thing. Um, but then there's been this interesting mixture of mobile and cloud that took a while to sort out where they fit and blockchain in that is something that is still trying to find its pacing um, specifically within this overall channel of, of game technology. So this isn't really here to, to dive into the bits, but to just give you kind of a top line perspective, there have been this interesting range of PC and console and handheld technology flowing back and forth over uh, a fairly long period. But what does that really mean? Um, Going to revenue, um, and I, I want to try to give a few different perspectives on this, but things started off really with arcade games, then console comes in, then handheld, then PC um, and mobile, and then VR, and these things are all moving and growing at different paces. Uh, this sense that we go from kind of one computing paradigm to another, and that we that most of these have been device um, at least at, at, uh, to our current understanding, um, where other things play a supporting role because of the, the, the primacy of basically running um, you know, 3D where possible on the device. Um, so just going back here for a second, uh, I just wanna note that um, this kind of wraps up in the um, in roughly 2018, 2019 period. Um, and what's interesting there, if you look at the end of it, is that this was starting to get up, I think it, it crests at about 139 billion um, for the, the total size of this gaming market. Um, and then in 2020 and 2021, it grows uh, and it grows drastically under the pandemic. Um, basically everybody goes online, everybody buys devices. And that's, that's what's led to our, our semiconductor and supply chain shortage in, in a large part is this notion that everyone's at home, everyone's on Zoom calls, 
Uh, everyone is buying devices. Everyone is trying to deal with the pandemic in different ways, but using similar tools and processes and computing for it. And so we go to 159 billion and 180 billion with a massive amount of growth um, that is starting to even out, but is not stopping. It's just slowing its acceleration a little bit. So um, monetization, again, just kind of for this overall perspective from arcades to consoles, to, uh, to personal computers, bulletin boards, PC shareware, PC MMOs, console online, mobile free to play. Um, you'll see this shortly in terms of, of specific timeline, but PC console online games uh, as a service actually coming into play coherently in the last decade. And then this experiment with blockchain just in the last um, you know, really year to kind of year and a half that we're trying to make sense of. And uh, a little bit before that, the rise and then, and then crash of ICOs and now the, the bubble of, of NFTs. Um, so what that has meant is that we have this timeline where you can see arcades grow and peak and trail off and basically die for the most part during the pandemic. Um, console has you know, had its, its crash in the 80s and came back um, from you know, effectively and simplifying it from Atari to Nintendo. Um, and then we've had PC start in the 80s and be fairly consistent. Um, sorry. But handheld grow and then technically really kind of fold into, into console. And, and then the rise of mobile as we as we get into the uh, effectively the um, the aughts and the, and then the teens uh, and then mobile take off to where it's become the largest part of game monetization um, really effectively by kind of subsuming uh, the beginnings uh, of what were first in PC of uh, of web gaming um, and then there's this tiny sliver of VR and effectively it's a thing that's always changing because there's this mixture of what are the delivery mechanisms and those change over time as we shift our, our computing paradigms from one to the next. Uh, and also as we widen the market, we bring more people in. So um, with these, I'm just gonna kind of show you, uh, show all of you a handful of, of different things for comparison. Um, I'll, I'll be frank, I'm, going to um, uh, bypass PC, uh, even though we're on that. Um, and it's frankly near and dear to my heart. It's where I started in this industry. Um, but um, the PC has been kind of a steady lifeline because it is frankly the most open. Um, the PC is a consistent thing. And then all these others have kind of moved around. Um, but you know, there, there've been many notions of the death knell of, the, of PC computing, and that's not going away anytime soon. So the PC has been uh, steady. It has grown, but it's kind of leveled. And it's interesting then for seeing these other ones come around it. So this is showing seven, or I should say from Gen 2 to Gen 7, we're now in Gen 9 of console. But console has seen this steady, um, really mathematical, um, you know, linear non-exponential curve of slow kind of plotting, but very consistent growth as the console market gets a little bit bigger, a little bit faster each time. So mobile, the interesting thing about mobile here is that, <clears throat> and, and Qualcomm is very good about, uh, about um, explaining this, Mobile is a really good illustration of the, the hardware computing industry moving in 30 year cycles. Um, Qualcomm and NVIDIA talk about this, but really the, the semiconductor folks as a whole, they understand that they are building devices across generally speaking 30 year cycles. Um, and, and what that means is that mobile is really reaching a peak 
in you know 2022 that effectively goes back to about 1992, um, and that first 15 years uh, of mobile was just kind of getting it set up, and and really it's been the last um, you know the, the last uh, let's say 15 years of smartphones, and effectively if you think about it, about five years or so of feature phones before that. But that's why when we look at mobile and it looks like it has um, you know, this, you know, the, the end of a hockey stick, it's because the full hockey stick is there. The first 15 years is growing to where we can get to, the, to that tip of the hockey stick. Um, and so you look at, at the iPhone curve um, <clears throat> and you see it, you know, in that period from 2007 to 2012, and it starts to grow quickly, and you get from, you know, from effectively 1 million to 10, you know, like a 10 to 20 to 40 to 75 to 125. And it's this very quick growth. And that's because it's built on the backs of 15 years uh, of, of growth before that. And if you go from just iPhone, then over to Android and you stick iPhone into Android and you look at the overall smartphone mobile space, um, that it's even more pronounced because of the additional volume of, of Android. And so mobile computing basically took off in that 15 years, figuring out what it needed to do and then growing exponentially at the end of that. But oftentimes, when people are talking about mobile, and you know, I, I was at id Software in that 2000, um, you know, th that 2010, 2012 period where mobile went from okay, we kind of have something interesting. Like, and I, you know, bought my first um, iPod Touch, going, it's a computer. I need to mess around with this, and then going, oh, everyone's getting this. At first, it's just a handful of us going, this isn't a thing I need to figure out how to play with and make sure I understand what it's doing and gradually learn how to make it sing. And then you go, you know, effectively, effectively, you know, you have this thing that started in 1990 and didn't have much of an impact. And I can remember my father, who was traveling for research, getting a satellite phone and going, oh, you know, in, in the 90s and going, what the hell is this thing? Going from that to, um, you know, having a, um, you know, a, a Motorola uh, feature phone and bypassing the rim space. But, you know, I can remember at EA, every producer had um, a, you know, had a Blackberry. They were all glued to it, but it was just the producers, you know, it was effectively, the you know quote unquote business side folks, and then going, oh, this thing with a screen comes out, I can use that, and then going from that to everyone has them, and then not just everyone has them, but everyone globally has them, and it becomes, um, you know, it, it it grows to the point where now no one has their phone far from them, it, you know. Everyone has their phone in their pockets, in their hands, um, on their desks, as I do right now. Um, everyone has it, and it becomes your second brain. Um, and so computing goes through this in these 30-year cycles. Uh, the internet right now is mirroring mobile in that they both started in 1990. Um, neither one of them is permanent the internet will probably eventually get replaced. Um, and just as ARPANET and BitNet were before the internet, um, if we can get to a metaverse thing down the road, uh, we're at peak internet, we are also at peak mobile. Um, we're seeing experiments into the next um, phase of both of those things uh, with AR glasses and with metaverse, and they're still very early. And they're still probably about 10 to 15 to 20 years away, but they need to be because the early folks are the ones who were, you know, in phones in the nineties. And then even in the early teens before the smartphone and the feature phone days. And that's kind of where we are right now with blockchain. Um, 
I'm, uh, and I'm aware of, of when it started, but for the impact on folks, gaming has been around effectively, and depending on how you want to count it, since the 60s to the 70s. Uh, VR actually even predates that um, with Sensorama back in, in, in the 50s, but blockchain is still trying to figure out its impact as, it's, as it is in relation to gaming. So with that, we're gonna to touch on cloud for a second because cloud um, is something that goes back to, uh, back to the aughts um, you know, and, and you know, effectively AWS in um, 2003 and uh, Azure in 2009 and others coming off of that. Um, you know, Amazon is, is frankly the big dog in the space. Um, I can remember a point where Amazon was, you know, eighty percent of the market. Now it's thirty-three percent. There's more diversity and there's more space. And this is just tracking here a few of Amazon to Azure to G Cloud to IBM Cloud, Alibaba Cloud, Salesforce. But you know, you can you can map out just the Chinese cloud because it's its own thing and it's largely behind the Great Firewall of China. Um, this is interesting because you can you can basically see that Microsoft, for the most part, started to make money uh, revenue off of cloud in you know this period of roughly 2013 to 2015, um, tracking here from the beginning of 2015, but then it starts to take off really steadily, 2016, 2017, 2018, and and now it's become a major part of of their revenue. Um, going from Microsoft to, um, to Amazon with the one on the right here, uh, and this is tracking a wider range. Again, this is tracking, um, if you look at 2009, that's when Azure started. And that's when, when Azure started is when Amazon really started to make money in cloud. But you look at that, that range and the period from, again, up to about 2013 is still very small. Um, and it's effectively the period from then around 2013, 2014, up to now where it's, it's started to grow exp, you know, um, you know, almost, almost exponentially. The, the impact is, is huge uh, where it was not before. Um, and then th the other thing I want to highlight is, is that especially in the enterprise space, um, cloud is is uh, is basically taking over um, that, and and what this is tracking is the amount of overall software to you know, to the amount of cloud. Where to be fair, this is going out to twenty thirty two, but what this is saying is that there's an expectation that around about twenty twenty four twenty twenty five that half the software globally will be running on cloud. That there's this assumption, um, you know, whether it happens or not, that more and more software is is growing. I, I actually believe that a good amount will stay on device, but that there's going to be this mixture of cloud and edge and blockchain. And we're still finding the balance and we're still finding the hybridization because in my mind, nothing, absolutely nothing ever replaces a certain amount of code execution on the device side, but we're learning to support. And right now we're mostly learning from cloud because cloud has this history going back to AWS in 2003. Um, and so this is, you know, we're now gonna kind of transition into blockchain, but I, I wanted folks to understand that looking at this, especially as it comes into games, but in a lot of other fields as well, um, the interesting thing is going, how did mobile impact? How did cloud impact? What lessons do you take from each? Because mobile and cloud have both drastically affected games. So now we're gonna dump uh, heavily into games and blockchain, but I wanted that, that grounding for everybody and I hope that was helpful. Um, so this was a survey uh, that came out just a few weeks ago. Um, this is a survey that I believe was taken um, in the period of December to January of this year. Um, and this is um, 
setting up for the Game Developers Conference, which happens out every March um, in San Francisco. And this is asking um, game developers who are connected into GDC and IGDA, um, the Game Developers Conference and the International Game Developers Association, what is your interest in cryptocurrency as a, pay as a payment tool? Most are not interested. What is your studio's interest in NFTs? Most are not interested. That can change, but um, I wanted to highlight that because the biggest thing that's impacting that is the current state of the NFT bubble and the amount of negative press because of how people are going into it and because of what is being announced. And it's not a fundamental view of the technology, it's where are we right now? <laughs> What's going on right now and how is that impacting people? And when they're reading industry news, what are they looking at and how is that shaping their perspective? Um, and, and frankly, when they're reading mainstream news and they're hearing about things, how is that affecting what they're, what they're going to develop on? Um, and, and the reason is because the reaction to this very loose range of Web3, NFT, blockchain, cryptocurrency that are mashed together, and they're different things, but the reaction to that as a whole is fundamentally different um, than the reaction to mobile and fundamentally different to the reaction to cloud. Because with mobile, some people immediately loved it and uh, a lot of other folks were like, ah, I don't quite know what that is. But the monetization for mobile happened slower than people believe. I remember it really well, and it took four to five years. Um, the interesting thing about that with mobile is that where it changed is everyone got smartphones. And when everyone got smartphones, no one really hated mobile. Some people were like, I want, to, I want to develop on it. I don't want to develop on it. But no one said, I don't want it to exist because everyone's like, well, I've got a smartphone. And all the game developers got smartphones faster than just about anyone else other than other technology folks. Everyone in technology adopted first. And so that's the thing to think about is nobody hated on mobile because everyone had one. No one hated on cloud because people started using it behind the scenes. Uh, at id Software, we were using cloud you know, going back to about 2009. Um, we were baking mega textures in AWS um, and uh, GPU, early G, you know, kind of rough GPU clouds. So cloud became an early foundational tech. Mobile became an ubiquitous, everyone's got one. Blockchain still needs to kind of find its pacing and find its path. And that's going to determine what people think of it. So um, I'll try to keep this going quickly. I'm, I'm, I know I'm going through a lot here um, and I'm a little bit behind <laughs> schedule. So zip through these. The ICO phase. The simplest thing to say about the ICO phase is that there's a point, especially here in San Francisco, where everyone was talking ICOs. Um, they took over from, from VR, they became the new big thing. Everyone went into them, everyone was doing them, everyone started to love them or hate them and, there was no, and they were polarizing. And then they all started to crash. And um, coming out of them, there were a lot of people who lost a lot of money in them and it failed and it failed really fast. Um, so, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, everyone has different kind of feelings on them, but some of those ICOs that succeeded, uh, that did not fail, that continued, they still, they went into the current NFT phase. Um, so it's important to keep that in context because a bunch of the negative feeling around ICO, or, sorry, around NFTs comes from memory of the ICOs that were really just a few years ago and that affected the development community, uh, I would say more than anything else. So um, how has blockchain interacted with games? Most coherently, not only, but most coherently, it is now this NFT phase where 
you've got a bunch of folks going from very different perspectives going, why don't gamers understand NFTs? And it's because it's a bubble. It's too quick, too soon. Um, it's got people piling in that are not the technologists. Um, it's taking a thing where even this notion of NFTs has been around for about 10 years and there have been NFT growth before that, but it has not gone into uh, effectively this range of fine arts and, um, and pop culture arts and a little bit of affecting the Hollywood range of kind of the passive arts of film, TV, music, and animation, and then coming over into games. And games is where it has been most negatively received. And I think in some ways it's because people are still sore about ICOs, but also the people going into it who have a financial background or a financial stake are coming into a thing thinking that it's the easiest thing for NFTs to go into when games are going, but we already kind of do 95% of this. We don't have a thing up on a blockchain, but all of these concepts came out of us. And now you're pushing them back to us with a twist, telling us to do these things <clears throat> that we already kind of do, but now we have to do them while somebody is trying to make a fast buck on them. And the financial aspect is the trickiest because we are concerned about our consumers. And this is what gamers see. Uh, this is a hilarious bit from the most recent South Park, but this is what gamers see. Gamers are terrified right now because they believe they're being set up to be exploited. I mean, I've, I've literally seen you're trying to turn us all into whales and then you want to carve us up. There's this feeling that in this bubble, yeah, it's a bit of the dot-com bubble, but there's this feeling of you're trying to set us up to gut us. And it's an, it's an existential fear and the market is not helping. And so coming out of that, it's trying to get away from that and go to something more positive that is not exploitation. So how can blockchain interact with games? Mostly I would say it's repeat the path of cloud, but also look at, at the practicalities of mobile because the reality is that cloud went in and brought in useful things and showed that they were useful and got adopted just behind the scenes. We all started using cloud first, just in our development processes, and then to roll stuff out and have it used more widely and to reach more folks and go, hey, this is actually better than bare metal. We've got to run a thing online and we'll spin up uh, this cloud instance and it will sit there and it's and cloud enabled us to go to better platforms and to go cross device. And so that's the thing to keep in mind is, is that cloud has been adopted because we just kind of went, well, we kind of have to use it because it just does these things that we need. And it's showing that there is stuff that you need and then going, you know, it, and it started with like, oh, I can dump my mega textures onto, uh, on, onto the AWS cloud. And instead of having my, mach my machine churning for four hours, I'll get something back from AWS in 45 minutes. That to us at id was magic. <laughs> I mean, we knew exactly what it was doing. We had set it up, but we're like, this is perfect. It's not tying up my machine. I just have to go into this, um, into this custom web browser and just look at how my thing is baking. Um, and we're like, that's, that's gold. <laughs> you make developers' lives easier and they love you for it because they're like, hey, AWS is just doing my thing and, it, and my machine isn't locked up. That's great. <laughs> then Microsoft came around and, and the rise of Azure started to fold into this notion of Xbox and all of these useful and interesting features and services 
that they were trying to find ways to get connected into and demonstrate in Microsoft Game Studios products and Xbox and were going, oh, I could actually use that, that bit of machine learning, that machine translation, I could use these things. So it's taking lessons from that. And so how is blockchain interacting with games now? Um, game publishers and developers that are in the traditional space are getting burned by NFTs for the most part, not everybody, but, and some are just being very careful about language, but there are a lot of high profile projects that, or, or developers or publishers that are talking about things and the public reaction is so negative that they are about facing things that they might have been planning for months or more for a year, you know, let's say a year or so, they are changing in 24 hours. Meanwhile, and, and it's happening because they have revenue, they have products, they have roadmaps, and blockchain for the most part is an ancillary thing, and NFTs were a cherry on top, but they're not going, we're going to make all of our money from that. Startups, on the other hand, oftentimes are being uh, driven entirely by investors, and they, um, and, and a lot of these blockchain, uh, let's say NFT startups, uh, I think is, is, is really what we should call many of them at this point, or NFT game startups, a lot of them do not have as their core staffing traditional folks from the PC console space. Um, even a lot of them don't have mobile. Um, they have some mobile developers, they have web developers, social media developers. It's new folks coming in and that's okay, but they are over promising and under delivering and they're selling a lot of NFTs and they're doing it with no understanding of what is needed to actually make anything. And so there's a certain amount of, I hope they don't screw up and I hope they don't make us look bad and how much of their stuff is going to disappear. And I honestly expect half of the NFT game projects to, to basically close up shop within the next year to two years. Regard, like It's not about money. Yeah, they, they got some money and usually they don't have enough. But in the game industry, we've had lots and lots of projects that had enough money, spent it the wrong way, built the wrong things, built multiple times over, threw away things. It's never about the money. And that's the thing that people who are pushing NFTs need to understand. It's about the intersection of art and technology to make something that you can't plan and that you can only iterate to achieve when you are trying to make games, when you're trying to make VR, virtual worlds, anything in that space. You can guess and how much experience and how much judgment is what gets you there but you can never put together a rock solid plan and you can never write a white paper ever. So how does the game industry view NFTs? I'm not gonna read all of these. I'm just gonna kind of call them out. You can dive into these. I'll, I'll make my deck available. A lot of these are in the news, but I'll just start with uh, Tim's quote, which I, I love for being, um, we are touching, we aren't touching NFTs as, as the whole field is currently tangled up with an intractable mix of scams, interesting decentralized tech foundation and scams. Now he, he changed this, um, but he changed it to spite uh, his competitor, Valve Steam. Um, he's not changing his core revenue, but he's making space within EGS for a thing because he knows that Steam isn't. And, he's, and they're still trying to figure out what the hell they're actually gonna do with it. And they don't know, um, but everyone's guessing. So why does the game industry care about, about scams or about bad behavior in NFTs that are reflected on blockchain and crypto? Because video games as a thing that's been around since the 60s um, that started to really gain traction in the 70s and has been going for a good long while now, effectively, six, you know, depending on how you want to count it, either five or six decades, we are still a new medium compared to TV, animation, music, uh, film. Um, and we still have legislators, especially in the EU, the US, the UK, who think of games as being for children. Um, and because of that, 
gambling laws are very real. Um, legislation around child endangerment, data privacy in general, child data privacy are very real. And what we know is that we, the video game or the game industry, can get hit by legislation when parents go to legislators and go, won't somebody please think of the children? <laughs> and it doesn't matter that most of the people playing are now adults. It just matters if children have access to your thing and they spend their parents' money and the parents complain. That is a, a cross that we, the game industry, have to bear and that anyone coming in has to bear with us. <laughs> so um, there's a platform response, which is that everyone's basically trying to fade into the background and go, yeah, we're not really ready to deal with this thing. So Nintendo, Microsoft, Sony, Apple, Google, Steam, Epic, also a bit of like Tencent and Samsung, all these folks that have platforms, they are one concerned about blockchain circumventing payment processing because that is where they get their cut. They take 30%, the developer publisher mix takes 70%. So they are concerned they will only consistently allow the stuff on when they figure out how to get their, let's say 20 to 30%. Maybe it is by having their own blockchains. Maybe it is by banning blockchains. Maybe it is by participating and having their own systems with their own nodes. There's any number of solutions, but they don't know fully yet. And most of them are doing different bits of kind of censoring and soft bans and pulling things and being very quiet about it because everyone's still trying to figure out this thing that they don't quite know if they want to live with. So here again, I won't go into all these. We're just going to zip through these, but EA is like, yeah, we're going to, no, we're not going to. Sega's like, yeah, we're kind of going to, but unless it seems like money-making and then we're not going to. Take-Two is like, yeah, we're kind of already doing all this, just not on the blockchain, but, but we have everything that you have already and we have it in GTA. <laughs> Ubisoft is like, yeah, we got this thing. Oh, nobody loves it. Uh, Team 17 is like, oh, we're doing a thing 24 hours later, we're not. Um, the, the stalker folks at, at GSC, oh, we're doing a thing. Actually, we're not. <laughs> uh, Square Enix, we're doing something, we're, we're using it, we're not going to say anything about how, but we've kind of got a thing. Um, Konami is basically going, yeah, so we're going to sell some stuff. Oh, we made, you know, $140,000. Great. It doesn't really affect, we're probably going to do more. It doesn't affect our bottom line. And Epic going, yeah, we're really not going to use it. Definitely not going to use it in Fortnite. Oh, Steam just said they're definitely not going to use it. We're going to use it, but we're not going to say how. We don't actually host any games. We're going to review everything, but we're not really going to say what we're going to do, but it's going to be kind of there. So it's this really confusing mess of things. <laughs> um, and how is this different from mobile? Um, mobile went in and the devices grew. It was driven by the devices. and Nobody just said, hey, I'm putting up a Medium blog or a white paper and we're doing this thing. No, they just went out and sold because the devices grew and the population grew. And you saw this step, like people talk about play to earn. Play to earn is bullshit. Um, I'm sorry, but you can't just go, hey, we're talking about a thing. We've mentioned it a handful of times on Facebook and on LinkedIn, therefore it exists. Free to play they just went out and did it. And then you went, oh, okay, there are about three variations on free, to, on free to play. And I can see like the appointment dynamics are here. The uh, consumable stuff is here. The durable stuff is here. They're finding this mix, but A, they're taking stuff that was kind of already in um, Facebook and web gaming and B, they're putting it out and I can go onto phones and I can find 10, 15, 20 examples immediately and they're making money. It's real when you're making money off of it, not when you're talking about it. Talk is cheap and we all do it and I'm doing it right now. But people go out in mobile and from 2012 to 2021, they took over a chunk of the game industry by expanding it and bringing new people in. They didn't initially try to cannibalize. They just went and said, 
we're bringing all these other folks in. So that's incredibly important. So with that, here's a really quick grounding and I won't go into the specifics of these, but just this is a scale effectively. Triple I to single A to double A to triple A to quadruple A. And then you got this blockchain thing over here that's kind of still almost being funded, at least initially. Like, oh yeah, we raised a bunch of NFTs, now we can grow. But the initial funding is kind of the scale of like building an expensive website. Not, you know, an enterprise website, but like a expensive commercial website where it's smaller than building a mobile game. And that's crazy. Um, especially because people are looking at it and going, oh, this is going to be amazing. And you're seeing a bunch of concept art and some pre-rendered videos and people are raising a ton of money on nothing. And so on the one hand, kudos to raising money, but on the other hand, do they know what they're doing? Because those six guys in the middle, um, that's my old boss on the left, John Carmack, uh, with Kevin Cloud, uh, Adrian Carmack, Tom Hall, John Romero, and Jay Wilbur, six of those guys built Wolfenstein and they knew what they were doing because they built the Commander Keen games, uh, uh, five or six of those before them. And they went on after Wolfenstein to Doom. They grew steadily and they grew along the scale. And the recent reboot of Doom um, that Kevin Cloud and John Carmack were still on, that was in that AAA phase and then you know and the next one will be in the quadruple a um, they scaled all through this and they understood it games understand this range of experiences and everything is tied to money and time and people as you get through it so what is game development i'm not going to go into all this but basically just to say it's this range of specializations art and animation design programming and engineering, audio production, and then behind the scenes publishing, which partially mirrors production. Um, all of these things are needed. Back in the day, we just wore lots of hats, but we did pretty much all this still back then with fewer people. You get to more people and bigger teams and there's more specialization, but this core notion of these art and animation design, programming and engineering, audio and production, these are consistent. Everything that we make needs this. And so you've got folks going in with NFTs going, we've got some concept art, we've got some economy design, we've got a little bit of community management and we're putting together a roadmap. Great, we can go write a white paper and we can put up a web page and we can, and we can raise money. And people in the game industry are going, no, you need to fucking make something like get something running. Like if, if you're going to raise money, show us that you have a thing in motion or at least have um, at least have a production plan that looks realistic and have a, a deck, you know, maybe you don't have a GDD, but like have a pitch deck that shows all the pieces of your thing and how it fits together. Um, white paper. <laughs> and like that, that's where the game industry is struggling to understand the notions that nfts are trying to bring in because they look like nonsense and we're basically going you don't have a plan and you're not going to be able to make a thing and your thing's going to fall apart and you're going to burn everyone who goes in on it because you don't understand what you're making and that's scary because those of us in the game industry are in it mostly because we love it there are more and better things to do if you want to make money faster than make games yes it is the biggest industry in the world but game makers traditionally are not the wealthiest people in the world. Um, we do this because we love it and we understand what we're making and we share it and we'll talk about it, but we want people to know what they're doing because everyone who's in it has battle scars. Everyone's been in the trenches. Everyone has lost sleep and, and been in crunch because of the craziness that is the unpredictability of making games. Game development is hard. Um, I won't go into all this, but th there is this notion, everyone in games know this, knows this. It comes out of traditional engineering, but we took it on. It's You get 90% of the way through. You finally know what you have. You're deep in the middle of the thing. And then you, get to, you, then you start up the other 90%. Uh, the remaining 10% 
is going to take another 90% of time. And, then, um, and, and I, I can remember both John Carmack and Tim Sweeney individually saying this directly uh, and taking it out of engineering. And then George Bassard going, oh yeah, like, and, and George was literally, you know, he's um, the, the founder of 3D Realms going back to du the Duke Newton days. And he was literally, literally replying to Tim Sweeney and like, you forgot the other, not the middle 90%. Um, and then I think th there's another person who's like, oh, and then there's, there's another 90% in polishing. There's this notion that like, it's, it's never done and it's always complex and it always takes more work than you think it will. And that actually gets to, to my quote at the end, um, which I had said a while back, which is that you can't make a great game the first time out, no matter who you are, you make a, you make a good game with a great team, figure out who you have, what your pipeline and what is what your process is. And then you're going to make a great game when you have a team that has previously made a good game together because you have to recognize how many 90% you have sitting in front of you. So online games are doubly hard. Um, remember that this is, this is being uh, shared out to everyone afterwards. You can go through this. Raf Koster, um, Fantastic developer and, and a great human being. Raf uh, was the lead designer for Ultima Online. Um, he was also the director for Star Wars Galaxies. And he's been involved at this point, I think in like five or six large MMOs. Um, at one point he went um, around the California and Texas MMO community and he started collecting rules, um, his, his rules of, of online world design. If something can, you know, high roops <laughs> loophole law, if something can be abused, it will be. Um, there are a ton of these, we're running out of time, I won't go through all of them, but what I wanna stress is that there's this collective understanding of 30 years of online game design that it is harder, more complex, more curious, and more mercurial than anyone realizes until they dive into it. So anytime someone new is coming in, we go, you're about to get screwed. We'll help you out as much as we can. We'll show you a bunch of stuff, but it's gonna hurt. <laughs> and it does. Um, and so there are a ton of these, uh, these rules. Players have higher expectations of the virtual world than the real one. Um, the psychological disinhibition of, if you have anonymity, people will be jerks. <laughs> um, the mass market problems of, your administrative problems will increase exponentially and not linearly. The notion that violence, either direct or social, um, psychological, will be done if you allow people to interact in the world no matter what happens. We do not, as an industry, believe that you can just let people go into a utopia and they will treat each other well and they will self-police and they can just set up a bunch of DAOs and run everything. We know from historical fact that some portion of the, that audience will always destabilize the rest and that the people who are paying expect a good experience. You have to police, you have to moderate, you have to curate, you have to deal with hackers, you have to help people push and shape into a, a right thing. And there can be a hybrid between even in a social order between centralization and decentralization, but you cannot have pure decentralization because it is chaos in games. So there's an identity crisis. Um, do you want to let people have a speculative penny stock, a unit of currency, a functional utilitar utilitarian tool? You, can, you know, the, the typical triangle of good, fast, and cheap. You can never have all three. Um, what we see here is that you can have two of these kind of, you can have one of these really well, you can try to do three and you'll tear yourself apart. What does that mean? That we don't really know what we're going into with blockchain gaming. Um, people hold up Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity is an outlier and it's not really a game. It's a gamified economy and it is the equivalent of Pokemon Go, where for a few years people said, hey, this is just the, the beginning of the, the tip of the iceberg of all these mobile AR games, and then none of the other ones ever got um, an audience. And mobile AR 
as an overall industry trend crashed. There's still mobile AR technology and there's still people messing around and it's going more local, but there is no field of mobile AR gaming. Uh, there is no revenue other than one thing. Axie Infinity is currently that. Um, you cannot prove an industry through one thing. So what do we have right now? We have NFT um, land sales, which are basically sell, trying to sell the, the, the Brooklyn Bridge or trying to sell people that they own a star. Um, it's not that it can't become something, but in the view of the game industry, if you haven't made a thing before, if you don't know what you're making, you tell a bunch of people in the current market, you can sell that and they will buy that, but you are selling hot air. And traditionally that is seen as criminal. Um, the person who tried to sell the Brooklyn Bridge was, was put in jail. <laughs> you cannot sell a thing that is either in the public common or that is uh, effectively, um, that doesn't exist. Upland right now is trying to sell stuff that are effectively in the, pu in the public common. Um, I'm hoping that they get knocked down because they should not be able to sell people's addresses. Um, that maps AR notion of connecting to address is great, but speculating on that worries me. Um, selling things that don't exist is a lot of what the games and NFT is doing right now because the people who are promising them have no idea the pain that they're gonna have in adhering to the contract for the sale that they made before they've actually made anything. Virtual item sales and avatar sales are the other part. And those are fraught with disaster because they run massive risks of changing the balance of the game and forcing you to rechange it. And the biggest example that I can bring up is Blizzard and Diablo 3. They set up the real money auction house and that real money auction house broke Diablo 3 and they had to close it down despite the fact that it was the most successful thing that they had ever put out. It was causing new people to come in less and it was causing people to stop playing and to just purchase. And they basically sat down and looked at it and said, this kills our gameplay, this kills our game. Do we only want the auction house? And they said, no, and they shut it down. The point is, it's really hard to balance a game and an, and an economy together. And this gets to my question and I'm just about done here. So we'll get wrapped up and I know we're, we're on time or we're, well, we're cresting at that time is that, do you want to make a game or do you want to make an economy? Anyone going into NFT gaming is going to have to ask this question because you cannot have your, your cake and eat it too. And connected in with that is that play to earn and what I call pay to exploit, PTE, is an unproven guess. It's a thing that we don't actually know. It's a thing that has not yet been defined. It has to be defined in practice and not in white papers. And what we see right now is that you can't have your cake and eat it too. And people are trying to do that and they don't know what they're going to come up against because you cannot coherently design play and work and have them have equal value. They will push at each other and one will win. And you have to prioritize in games when we're doing game development, you always have to prioritize your features, your service, your design, your plans, your content. You have to prioritize play and work also. Do you want an economy first or do you want a game first? A game is about play and leisure activity. A, a work product is about productivity and knowing that you did something consistently and you cannot have the thumb on the scale on the one hand and have balance and curation on the other. So what can blockchain um, advocates do? Slow down, let the bubble burst, find experiments, learn and listen, understand the space, um, help to build consortiums, help to grow and figure out standards and fight scams because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, the, just pointing out the hardest thing in games is raising money at the start. Um, 
game developers do want help with this. Every new person coming into games wants to figure this out, but it has to be done without locking the people into a design that is not yet done. That's the problem with NFTs right now, is they're locking, they're pre-selling and locking in a design where the people who are, who are selling it do not know the design. Even, even if they're experienced developers like Peter Molyneux's group, who sold, I think it was 54 million in, in, in virtual land, and, and Peter's fantastic, and he's a veteran with more experience than I do. And if you sit down and talk to him honestly, he's probably excited and terrified because he has a lot of people who've been sold a lot of stuff, and they have to figure out what the hell their game is because you never actually know until you're making the game. So what are the issues? I'm not going to go into all these, but my God, they're complex. I, I could do a lecture just on these, and I'm actually going to be doing a panel discussion on all of these at the Game Developers Conference next month. There are a lot of problems. Every problem can be solved. Um, but the issue is there are now more problems than solutions. And the people who are coming in are focused on making money and not solving. And so talking to your group here, figuring out how to work with enterprise, figuring out how to provide experiments to evolving ideas to solutions, because we want to make sure that we actually solve these. Because the game industry always takes in new technology, but we never guarantee that it's going to be a hit in the first year. And it takes time to figure things out. And there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I had a whole thing on interoperability that I'm mostly going to bypass. Um, it's here in my notes. <laughs> um, I will just say that interoperab easy interoperability is a myth. And without going into all the complexity of a few slides, I'll just say, take a socket wrench, jam it in a chocolate cake. That's interoperability in games because every group makes their game individually. They use middleware engines in different ways. Lots of folks still build custom engines. Most of the games that make money do not use Unreal or Unity and probably never will. Every major developer, frankly, every publisher has multiple custom engines. Everybody rolls their own. Call of Duty has three different custom engines for the three different groups that make sure that Call of Duty comes out every year. They cannot be interoperable just within Call of Duty across years. A socket wrench has measurements. It's used for automotive repair. It is an artificial human construction. A cake is also an artificial human construction. A socket wrench is not tasty. A cake is not great for automotive repair. They are two things built by humans for different things. Trying to take assets from one game to another is the socket wrench and the chocolate cake. And until people realize this and stop acting like it's easy, we can't actually make file format standards that can allow us to eventually do it in the future. Because we could have a thing where we can go, the socket wrench is part of this class and the cake is part of the consumables class and this tool class and consumable, we can do all that. And that's gonna take 10 to 20 years to, to, it's gonna take 10 years to do it and another 10 years to get people on board. It's absolutely doable. If we wanna to get towards a metaverse and shared stuff, it can happen but it does not happen easily and it's really not happening now. So there, there's a whole lot of, of what can and cannot be done with interoperability, um, but I'm just gonna come back to the blockchain trilemma. You guys already understand this from the perspective of security, scalability, decentralization. You can't have all of these perfectly. In that same fashion, Going into games specifically, there is a blockchain trilemma in games of a particular thing that you bring in cannot be a penny stock, a currency, and a utilitarian tool. Right now, just about every group going in is doing that, 
It needs to be, it's like pick one first, make one your primary choice. What's the secondary? Let the third one fall away. Everything coming in has to choose that because games are about hard choices. So I, I know I've gone a little bit over. Thank you guys for being, um, uh, for, for being patient. Um, I can stay on for questions if, if you have them. Um, but I, you know, I, I've been dealing with this. I'm actually going to be bringing this um, to the Game Developers Conference. We are wrestling with this issue now. Uh, we're trying to make sense of it now. So it's, it's, not an, it's not an easy issue. And I think, there we go. Um, if you have a file, I think that was very- I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, I think it was very, very informative. Thank you so much. I think uh, if anybody has any questions, you know, please feel free to uh, put them in the uh, Q&A here. Uh, and uh, or, or you can just speak up. Uh, you know, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, have your question. Uh, we can be here for another couple of minutes. Um, if not, uh, thank you very much for joining in, and uh, we'll be sharing the presentation and and the uh, recording uh, on the wiki, on the Hyperledger wiki. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Afail. I think we'll probably uh, wrap it up now. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, I'll just say um, you guys are, are welcome. Um, I, I do need to spin my, my Twitter backup. I still haven't done it. I've been slammed with stuff, but uh, you can feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm active on both Facebook and, and LinkedIn in terms of, of kind of community building, um, gradually uh, finding my way back onto Twitter. Um, and, you know, if, if you have questions, feel free to reach out. I think I, I included my, uh, my email um, at, at, the, at the end of this um, if you are trying to make sense of the space, we all are, um, and, and I'm happy to, uh, to pr provide what uh, help and guidance I, I can. Thank you, Rafael. And I think just to, just to wrap up on that, I, I guess that's uh, one of the things we have in the gaming subgroup is exactly to, to basically uh, be learning by learning and do. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do here. Like you uh, indicated in your, I think towards the end of your slide, I, I think one very important thing is to cut the high path, learn and do, like, like do some more experiments and uh, don't, don't just sort of rush in with the technology, don't, don't make technology the religion. So I think that's a very, very uh, a solid point out there. Um, actually, there, there's one question and, and I think you, you'd posted it, it looked like it was Pratik who'd posted it a couple of times. Um, I think that the the biggest um, let's see, turning it back to, to that question, um, I, I would just say that the the biggest thing that people can learn, um, or what would the advantages be of decentralization of records? Um, it would be useful to start between games across a develop one developer first, because even going from like a, a within a franchise. Um, there could be potential to start there because a developer can control its own stuff in order to do early experiments in, in interoperability and then potentially to go to other games within a publisher. Um, we're probably going to need a, a metaverse to get to um, decentralization of records to be useful across the board, but we already do a lot of the things just not on a blockchain and it's like the core of your question is we need to find ways to start sharing in little ways. A developer to share from one of their games to another game, a developer to share from one game to a sister studio's game, or from one of their games to another game within the same publisher. Baby steps are, are what we need. And we need to basically prove out and show, hey, we did this and it didn't hurt too much. And we actually got some benefit out of it. So like, again, like think of it as like the early days of mobile and cloud, we have to show little things that don't affect your revenue that much, but that show that they effectively save a little bit of time because down the road that will save your revenue, that will grow your revenue and eventually it will provide new paths. But first we have to go, this doesn't put us in jeopardy. We did a thing, it worked. We learned something new and now we've got new ideas coming off of that. That is correct. <laughs> and uh, Pratik, uh, we'll, we'll, we are actually looking at these exact kind of questions in our gaming subgroup. So you're more than welcome to join in and uh, 
we have this conversation going on in terms of, I, I think one of the, the biggest points that Rafael also pointed out to is that, yes, it's possible, but the, the two critical things for sharing assets across games is you got to have shared standards. Uh, you, you can't, like like in Rafael's presentation, you can't just take a wrench and, and slam into uh, another game, uh, you know, that being a, a chocolate cake in this case, because it's not going to mean the same thing in the other game. So unless you can have shared standards, and unless those standards are agreeable across not only from technology point of view, but also from legal aspects, uh, also from the context point of view, uh, it's not going to be useful in the other game. And uh, those are, are some of the biggest challenges in terms of sharing NFTs, even across games or, or, or coming up with uh, shareable games. I think there's probably one more question here. Uh, okay, uh, that's just a critique. Okay. I think uh, that should be the end of our presentation. I uh, think there's any questions, but please do, do uh, feel free to reach out to either Rafael or myself. I'm once again, uh, Sandy Agarwal, and uh, I'll be more than happy to uh, have you as part of the, uh, the gaming subgroup. And we'll most likely be bringing Rafael back for another panel uh, in, in some, uh, you know, another few weeks. Uh, so reach out to us if uh, you're interested. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming in. Thanks everybody, and and thanks for having me. Um, happy to come back, and yeah, let's let's figure out some standards. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks everybody.